guys. Welcome back to My Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan May. Another fantastic day for an interview. And I have got Karen Robinson with me. Karen is the is a woman who has made it her mission to help others with their own hero journey from victim to survivor to thriver. And that is the most beautiful hero journey that one can go through. The problem is, of course, like with every good film, there has to be some drama in there or some trauma in there, shall I say. And some of us have collected more than their fair share of trauma. So I think Karen is no, no different to me there. And that's the reason that we are both driven to make this world a better place, one interview at a time. So I'm so excited to have Karen on my show. Welcome to my show, Karen. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. <laughs> it's so hard. Here we are, thrivers, uh, after having been in the darkness. But we're never starting out like that. It is, you know, you never go to your mom and says, you know, one day I'm going to have a podcast. You know, I'm going to talk about trauma and how to get better. Yeah. No, <laughs> said no six-year-old ever or eight-year-old. Uh, what did you want to be? What do, who did you want to become when you were a child? Well, first, that question tickles me because I don't who knew there would be podcasts when we were children? <laughs> <You know? laughs> true, true. There was no internet for crying out loud. It was just in its infancy. Touche, touche. Yeah, I, we had three television channels growing up. Um, so not even cable. So having a podcast is just unheard of. <laughs> so when I was a really young child, I really wanted to be like a detective, like Nancy Drew. Yeah. Oh, Nancy True. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then my house um, was almost broken into and I was home alone with my little brother. And that took that mystery out for me. I, I decided that wasn't my path anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you say nearly broken into what, what stopped the perpetrator? I um, was in third grade and I had the thought well, he might not know anybody's here because there's no cars in the driveway. So I, I jumped and, and turned on all the lights in the house. Perfect. Yeah. And I went to the door and it was one of those turn locks and yeah. it was almost all the way turned in the open position. So I, I quickly turned it back because I heard him picking the lock. Huh. Um, yeah. We lived in a little tiny trailer that you could hear anything outside so I and I, I could hear well it started out I can't believe I'm telling you the story but it is trauma too um it started out our, I heard our horse going crazy in the pasture absolutely crazy and and he was trying to cut the tail so this this man had um escaped an institution oh goodness and and uh had stolen some high-powered rifles and knives at a different house um, oh. I think he just wanted to see what we had, but once he knew I was home, he he hung around, but he didn't do anything to hurt me. Oh, so. goodness. <laughs> Welcome to it my is, childhood. Yeah. He, well, and then the Royal Canadian Mountain Police were looking for him. So when my parents got home, they thought the other was home. They both did shift work. They went and got the 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 Mounties and um, you know, they surrounded the house and they eventually found him. But he was playing the flute in the woods, beat around our house. It was really an interesting night, but it was the first time I had a panic attack. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And yeah. that was third grade. So you were about nine, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. That's about. Yeah. My my little brother was hiding under the bed. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. That's yeah, an that's interesting start of life. Um, <laughs> And you were saying in a trailer, does that does that transfer into into not such a uh, a rich childhood, or was was that just where you're born on the wrong side of the tracks? Yeah, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, we grew in the up in the middle of nowhere in, in New Brunswick. Um, I was on my grandparents' property, and my and. Uh, my parents did struggle. They had domestic violence in their relationship, mm -hmm. um, which greatly impacted my brother and I. Mm -hmm. um, and child abuse as well. 
So physical, um, um, emotional. And I didn't know it until I was in social work program that it was actual sexual abuse as well um, due to the comments made and um, the attempt to get me to watch pornography. Um, I suspect there might have been something that happened when I was younger, but I have no memory of that. And so um, I'm not working on uncovering memories I don't remember. Mm. I think if it was meant for me to remember, I eventually will at some point. Because um, of all the work I've done on myself and with ther- in therapy, mm. it hasn't come up yet. Beautiful. But um, beautiful. Both of my grandpa- grandfathers were pedophile, so uh, it makes me wonder if something happened. I just don't remember. Wow. Yeah. You say yeah. that now with just a, such a calm voice. Um, it when did that materialize in your knowledge? Well, one grandfather we lived on his property, and I was always just very leery of him. And so, again, home alone a lot, he would try to come in the trailer to load up the stove because it was, you know, really cold in the winter. I wouldn't let him in. Mm. And so I was like, that's interesting. I won't let my grandfather in. Um, But my mom actually said, you know, my mom knew something um, that he had um, hurt his children and grandchildren, other grandchildren. So she she was okay with me not letting him in. My father kind of chuckled about it. And then the other grandfather, I was really close to, really super close to. And um, when I ran away from home, I was going to move in with my grandparents. And then that's when my mother told me that her father had been abusing her um, in childhood. And so that wasn't an option at that point. And it was very devastating because I saw him as a a father figure. Uh Um, I don't remember him doing anything to me I, I remember like kisses on the lips that were probably not appropriate we're, well were not appropriate um but in my childhood memory they it seemed you know pretty in, in, innocent mm. he seemed to adore me but even now looking back it, it, it doesn't feel healthy um and I wish my mom had told me before I, I ran away from home that that wasn't a safe place for me to be yeah, when did you run away from home? Um, I had a suicide attempt. It was before 12. And when that didn't work, I had taken, I had hidden razor blades into my shirt pockets in my closet, but I'm so scared of blood. I just could not bring myself to do it. And so I took generic Tylenol. Wow. And I don't even, I didn't count the pills. And now I can't recall if it was one handful or two handfuls, but enough that I felt would be enough to die. Um, And I just prayed to God when I went to sleep that he would take me, but I woke up. I was pissed off at first, but then I thought, well, maybe there's a reason that I didn't, he didn't take me. And so I endured the abuse that nobody knew at that time that I did that because I woke up completely fine. no one knew at that point. And so I I took the abuse a a while longer and then I decided to run away. Um, My mom had left my dad for a while. And when she says she was going back, that's when I, I I just could, I just couldn't go back. So I ran away. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where do you run to as a young child? Yeah, I was probably almost, I was almost 14 at this point. Oh my God, this is so silly. I I packed my, a duffel bag. I used to play basketball. So it, my duffel bag was my clothes and I took my boom box. One bag of clothes and my boom box. And no plan, no plan. <laughs> I left, <laughs> I left. Oh, we, mom and I just had a huge fight. Uh, the, the worst fight we ever had because she was determined to go back to him. And so I actually ran to a phone booth and I know people listening mean, you know, the younger generation may not remember those. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, these were were Um, funny little boxes, which typically stank. And, and, (laughs) but there was actually a phone in there that you can lift up and put money in there. And you could actually talk to someone, an amazing thing. It didn't have any, any screens. There was nothing there to swipe. (laughs) It was the old fashioned way. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And so I, I started. 
yeah, I started with a couple of friends and um, my friends were really happy to let me stay, but their parents, not so much. They didn't want to get involved, you know, with the runaway. They knew that there would probably be legal um, issues with that. And so I called, this was in um, New Brunswick. So I called my aunt who was living in, in Maine. Um, and I called her and I told her I ran and she said, okay, I'll be right there. And so from there, I met with um, a social worker. Um, they were looking for foster care for me. Um, my aunt didn't really have the space for me. She had children of her own. Mm -hmm. And so they look for a foster home. I was gonna live with my high school teacher, uh, my English teacher. And then last minute during the, the Christmas holiday, she said, um, I can't take you. My husband and I are, are trying to work out. She was also going through a divorce. She was in, in having a child come stay with us. Mm -hmm. This is not the right time. So then they talked about living with nuns. I was petrified of that because <laughs> I was a young teenager. And then my aunt said, you know what? We're just going to make space for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. I, I lived with my aunt and uncle um, through high school and they took excellent care of me. Um, I was rebellious at times, but nothing like, but very vanilla for what kids do nowadays. Um, and I got really good grades and ended up with a scholarship to college. Oh, beautiful. Got my bachelor's in social work, my master's in social work, and really was on my way to being successful at this point. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that's that sounds a little bit too good to be true in all fairness um okay that is no, <laughs> that no, no, easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's that's the i i don't know the semi-sanitized version it sounds like me it wasn't and you said, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think the the my my thought is i mean here you are giving us the facts i think and with mm. very little emotion i must say you would have been an absolute chaos of emotions um what was the predominant emotion that drove you was it fear was it anger was it resentment sadness yeah uh, i'm sure i felt all of those at the time yeah. um when my aunt and uncle said they could stay i had tremendous relief mm. um, i was very close to my aunt she was has always been in my life as a young child she was consistently there, she would bring my brother and I food. We had lived in poverty. Um, she would bring us food. She, when we moved out, she helped mom get an apartment. She helped put furniture in it and food. You know, she was always a hero, heroine of mine. So she was the, the you know how they say one, the ch child needs one consistent mm -hmm. adult who's there. She was definitely that person. Uh. Um, yeah. And so I think anger at my mother was huge, even though she wasn't, you know, the main abuser in my life. Um, I resented her um, for not telling me about my grandfather sooner. Um, definitely depressed, definitely anxious. Um, but it's hard to remember those feelings right now. You know, you know what it was like when I think about when I think about being that age, you know, when looking at my children as they are the different ages I was, yeah. it's it's hard to believe that I had so much going on. Yeah. You know? And you don't uh, realize my, it when you're in it. For you, right. that's normal life. You don't compare right. it with with things. You don't yet have that emotional ability to actually see that whatever it is happening. Yeah, that's happening to me. That's that's me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And however traumatic with hindsight it is. Um, having said that, it leaves certain traits. It leaves mm -hmm. certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You don't trust anyone. You uh, become fixated on controlling everything that you can possibly control because that's the only thing that you can do. And of course, you're tempted to stop the pain. Mm -hmm. And some things can be rather interesting to out there. For mm -hmm. example, alcohol. <laughs> or a joint, or sex, or, 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 or. So mm -hmm. spill the beans. What was yes. your escape? What was what your... Was my, what was my drug? Yeah. My drug was food. And uh, it's still quite a, quite the struggle. Hmm. Yeah. So food has always been um, uh, my soothing balm. Hmm. My favorite food of all time is ice cream. 
And when I lived with my aunt, she owned restaurants. And so they always had ice cream. Oh. And I remember some days, like, because she would go to work early. And, and so I would just have some ice cream before going to school. And it made everything better. <laughs> and in all fairness, ice cream makes everything better. Let's <laughs> gift it, gift it credit. Um, the problem, of course, it is a, a calorie dense food without much nutrients. And it is giving you a beautiful sugar fix. Um and yeah, so sugar has been my thing. Oh, Yo-yoing please. all my life. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Mm-hmm. It is, um, and that really got worse after I stopped drinking. When I went into mm-hmm. rehab in my mid forties, my goodness, I exchanged the alcohol for sugar um, for a year. I probably at we had gummy snakes, uh, and I mm-hmm. had I had. I should have bought shares in the gummy a gummy <laughs> snake factory, honestly. So guilty as charged. Um, so and there's so many people out there who use food uh, in one way or the other to relieve the tension. That could be overeating. Yeah. And I think the two of us are probably fo- are fitting into that. There are other people who are bulimic and where the, the the vomiting causes the release. Others are anorexic. All those kind of things are, mm-hmm. are dysfunctional relationships with food in response often enough to trauma. So yeah. it is, it is what it is. And it's beautiful that you say that and that you admit it because we all want to do it. But we, we don't have, we don't know better. And for that second, it feels good. And the tension releases. And the pain is just that little bit less. And for that, we would give an arm and a leg. And I think that's that's mm-hmm. the, the truth. My yeah, goodness. I was in denial. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was in denial for a really long time about the sugar thing. I just thought I loved it, appreciated, mm-hmm. like I was a foodie. And then um, <laughs> I, rem- I remember getting a bad phone call one day that was something that happened to mom and she was in the hospital. Yeah. And subconsciously, it, it came out of my mouth without zero thought. I said, out loud, and I was home alone, I said, I need ice cream. And it 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 shook me a little bit, took me off guard, because I had never gotten it, the message that clear. Uh, <laughs> my, so I think before I would just find myself at the freezer. Um, uh, yeah. So I can't uh, keep ice cream in the house, basically. Telling all my secrets today. <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 your your journey. That's your own journey where you where we both are on on a mission to create the best version of ourselves. But it is an ongoing journey. I don't want to call it struggle because I actually enjoy the challenges. Um, so. I don't I'm no longer struggling really with it, but I'm I'm realizing that I've got a privilege of making choices at any one moment in time. And sometimes I choose maybe some chocolate or an ice cream. Mm-hmm. Or more times than not, I choose something maybe different. I still like the coldness. So I get a bag of frozen blackberries or or something like that. Um, and I still get the cold and the refreshing, etc. So uh, you can I make different choices nowadays most of the time. But sometimes <laughs> it needs to be a cheesecake. Okay. Just and don't stand between me and the cheesecake. Okay, that's all I can say. Wouldn't so, dream of it. <laughs> <laughs> but that is that is that is us. And it's beautiful the way you, you say it. So there you were. Were you tempted to go into the restaurant business and follow your aunt's footsteps? Or where how did how were you in school? Because the other thing that often happens in children who have got not such a nice childhood or actually a very traumatic chi- a childhood uh, at home, they start excelling at school or spend most of their time at school. How did that work for you? Yeah, I was all into school. It was everything. Yeah, so I worked in my aunt's restaurant at times uh, as a younger child. And then um, she had sold it and she was working in a, a local restaurant and I worked at the same restaurant in high school. And it was really hard work. Oh, it is. And so it was really, really hard work. And she's always worked her butt off. Um, and I decided I I wanted, I, 
a job that was less laborious, <laughs> laborious, I guess the word is. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I heard it both ways. That was like a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I knew pretty early in high school that I wanted to be in the helping professions. And one of my cousins was actually in social work and she told me about social work and I was like, okay, that's what I'm doing. Cool. You know, I was like, I was really involved in peer education and it was a group called students offering support. I was, I worked on the hotline. Um, I, I was very, very involved in high school activities and I worked at the restaurant and I just loved learning. So school was definitely my thing. Was work an escape for you? Did you throw oh. yourself into the work? <laughs> exactly. Wait, what are you doing? Yes, you, you're telling all my secrets for sure. Yes, I, I still, I love working. I, yeah. It's, it's, I love, like, I, I know that I work too much. So I have these cycles where I cut way back and plan more fun things, more relaxing things. And I'm always, I always go back to filling my schedule. Mm. Uh, I think it helps that I, I love the work I do with clients now. And then with the pandemic, cool. there was such a need. Absolutely. There was such a need. And I'm like, yeah. well, you know, and I always uh. have financial goals and people needed <laughs> help. I'm like, yeah. oh, this is a win-win until, you I know, can... burnout starts happening and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> See, I saw you coming a mile away. <laughs> You're oh, my yeah, soul yeah. sister, okay? <laughs> same traits here, the same traits. Because I became a workaholic and an alcoholic. Those kind of things were perfect for me to uh, avoid having to deal with my with my inner demons, having to deal with the emotions, not having to feel the emotions, just escaping. Um, mm -hmm. And I became very good in that, uh, in both things. But hell, sooner or later, these bloody things, these kind of emotions, they catch up with you. Um, so the food gave you temporary relief, but there would have been rage. There would have been anger. Um, sometimes alcohol can allow that to really come out. How did you, did, did you channel negative emotions? I think that's a thing. I think my go-to was writing. I would, oh, right. I would just write and write and write and write and just let it out that way. Beautiful. And I told I told everybody secrets in my writing. You know, so I I, um, I think it's Anne Dodd that has it. And I, I don't say her phrase right. I put more flavor and drama into it. But it, it says something like, if you don't want to be written about, don't be an asshole. <laughs> and the asshole word is not in there. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And so yeah, that was that was my way of just really getting it out. Beautiful. Yeah. And what a healthy way that is of actually journaling and of actually writing it down. Because often enough there's such a shambles of thoughts and fragments of thoughts and emotions whooshing mm -hmm. around in your brain and in your heart. You have no idea. And the moment you actually take time, because you can't write so fast, you actually have to have to, have to take time to find the words and write them down. And suddenly, it certainly happened to me that I wrote things. That's the thing. The most the most interesting one was when I was typing. I was typing away on my on on a chapter of my book, and I had a writer's block, and I had no idea what to write. And so I just did a forceful, just write something, write bullshit, write the most, whatever, write it, just write it. And mm -hmm. I wrote some absolute crazy shit. And suddenly I observed my fingers typing mm -hmm. some very, very deep stuff. And it was like and an out of body. Exactly. Yeah. It was out of body experience. Well, ah, ooh, good, ah, goosebumps. Um, mm -hmm. So it was really a very heavy stuff that came out that I had no clue about. But my subconscious suddenly brought it out and boy yeah. okay so that is a beautiful way of channeling and exploring the depth of your mess in there and you already mm -hmm. turned it into a message by actually writing it down literally message in a bottle kind of a thing at the moment but wow so okay food and writing um how did that story continue I was boy crazy. And so that was a dilemma because the rules in my aunt's house were really strict. So um, 
boys were another way to capture my attention. I remember I loved English. I loved reading. I remember we were working on the, the book Moby Dick, which I love that book. I remember sitting in class like this and just thinking about my boyfriend. <laughs> just like, <laughs> so really preoccupied with boys um, uh, and unlucky in love for a long time until my wonderful uh, husband now, who's super healthy. He's, he's way healthy, healthier mentally, physically. I mean, well, I'm, I'm not sure about spiritually. <laughs> I might have an edge. I don't know. But he's such a good guy. And so I was like, wow, I really had to kiss a lot of frogs before I found him. Oh, so, sometimes yeah. you have to do yeah. that. And honestly, yeah. Yeah, a lot fun. of frogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I married some of those frogs too. Yeah. You know, oh, goodness. Them. Okay. You really yeah. had a collection yeah. there going. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> was that was that collection? I mean, who attracted you? Was it bad boys that attracted you? Um Yes, that was my MO in high school. Hmm. In college, I didn't date for a while. And then when I started to date, I married that person. I, I was, I, I love mysterious men. Hmm. Um, and so one of the attractions was men from around the world. Uh. So um, my first husband was from Haiti. And he was a, a lovely man, but he got really exacerbated with me at times. Um, I married him way too young. We were in college and he was like an old man, you know, that his personality, very serious guy. He was really kind to me, um, but I wasn't finished growing and I wanted to go out with my friends and, and so forth. And he, he had a hard time with that. So we ended up uh, divorcing. So uh, after that divorce, I dated around the world. I think it was one guy from Ethiopia, one guy from Spain, and a guy from Peru. I dated all three for a while, and I ended up being married to the man in Peru <laughs> who had a terrible temper that I didn't see during our courtship. It was a very short courtship. I was getting old by this point. I was getting to be 30. Oh, that's really then, <laughs> I have ovaries. And so we 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 ended up having a beautiful baby girl, Lena, uh -huh. uh, who's named after one of my grandmas. So um, that marriage also didn't last. Um, I was a therapist at the time, uh, missed all the, the signs. Uh, I suspect he has bipolar disorder, but just really not a good fit. We had a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Um, I think I was trying to marry opposite the old man, so I, or I married the little boy. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun, but it wasn't, uh, you know, a stable marriage. And so we got divorced, and I took a break for a long time. I was living in Japan with my daughter. Oh, wow. I was a federal social worker. And we, we just traveled around the world, and I dated very little. I, I did, and out, out of the five years there, I dated um, a man from Japan. Um, and I also dated, uh, a one Marine date, one Marine, and you might be done dating Marines. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I it learned, be... um, go ahead. No, no, it's beautiful because you were obviously very open to the, to the universe and open to the world. Mm -hmm. Um, that was, um, there was. Uh, you certainly did not restrict your life, but you tried to live life to the fullest. If I yeah. if I get mm -hmm. the feeling right there, which mm -hmm. is powerful, for which adventure. is beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for you to take opportunities to go, oh, I'll go to Japan or, hey, Chile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chile sounds good. You know, it <laughs> is, it's beautiful. So you actually took action there. You actually um, were were going out there trying to find the right fit for you trying to yeah. to figure out i guess figure out to a certain degree who you were is that fair to say yeah i had friends um in japan who were shocked so my husband at the time went with me to japan even though my the reason i applied to go was to get away from him <laughs> um but we had a child, so I didn't feel like I could tell him no. I just knew it wasn't going to work. We got to Japan. He um, took money out of our bank account, the, the car payment, and, and gave it away to someone in his family who needed help, but I needed the car payment. And it was just the last straw. Like I, I can't 
mm. live feeling so insecure about, you know, I needed a car to go to work. So that ended, and my friends were really surprised. Like one of the first things I did to heal is I booked a two week trip to China with my daughter and I, and we went to the Great Wall, we went to the Terracotta Warriors, and I grieved when we weren't um, at a tour site. You know, I grieved, she grieved, she was like three at the time, three and a half. You know, we grieved, but we also um, ate good food, we went to shows, we explored. It was just, that was what I wanted to do for healing. I didn't want to um, struggle trying to work with clients. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to mope around the house. So that's, that's how we, we handled our healing. Was it healing or was it escaping? I know you like that question. Um, <laughs> can I say it's both? Exactly. I think so. It is. And it's sometimes, uh, I'm struggling with that too, because there <clears throat> is a method in madness. There is, you need to take action to heal. And sometimes that action is maybe throwing yourself into work or throwing yourself into a journey or doing whatever you you do i'm i have done that so many times in different forms some of it was escapism some of it was actually doing something else that gives you distance so you can actually evaluate so you can actually review what really has happened to you because so often in my life I was far too close to it I couldn't see it I couldn't see what was happening and by actually getting a bit of distance you suddenly suddenly the lights go on and suddenly you see the the bigger picture than rather than maybe the pain or that insult or that betrayal whatever it was that that particular trauma uh meant for you so now this is this is beautiful this is beautiful and and this is it's yin and yang there is mm -hmm. not not always good and always bad and therefore i think that's the important thing that we need to realize this is your journey guys um you are you have gone through the trauma and you have been the victim by definition for a moment in time some some of us stay there longer than others I mean, the pity party, were you ever, ever in that boat? Were you ever wallowing in that mud? Mm -hmm. Totally. And I was prone to depression anyway. There's this family history of depression and anxiety. And so there, there were times that was felt impossible to go to work. Like I, I missed a lot of work the, the year, the, the, Divorce was one of the most painful things for me because we had a child together. Mm. And so that, I mean, lots of time in bed, wallowing, and uh, for sure, totally felt that the two failed marriages as a therapist, you saw a lot of couples, it was, whew, mm. it was quite the blow. It's like, well, should I be counseling people when <laughs> I'm struggling with this myself, right? Um, oh, interesting, sure. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, healing was slow, but one of my other escapes was reading. I'm a voracious reader. I read probably three books a week. Cool. I will read instead of sleeping. I love right. books. They're the ultimate escape other than travel. So um, I did a lot of reading as well. Uh, I went to therapy, started some medication to help me sleep. <clears throat> and then... Um, I started working on my PhD <clears throat> and decided it wasn't, I, I tried it because I thought it would be too hard for me. And when I saw that I could do it, the work, it became less interesting and too time consuming. So I decided <laughs> to adopt a child instead. Oh, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. As a single mother, right? A, a little girl. Um, I, I didn't <laughs> seek it out on purpose. I was doing adoption work on the side. Right. You know, helping people with home studies because that way I could travel. And uh, uh, one day a woman called me and asked me for help. And I said, well, I don't usually work with, with moms who are placing their child for adoption. I usually work for families to help them prepare. And she's like, I don't know what to do. She was in a little island in Japan. She was, I don't know what to do, but I, I can't keep the baby. Wow. And I said, okay, well, I guess I will take your baby. 
I'll adopt her. Well, I didn't know it was her. I'll adopt your baby. Out of my mouth. Just, and I was like, what? what are you thinking? You're single. You have a child. What are you doing? But my, my daughter at home was like, mom, you help all these people adopt. What about us? And I'm like, I have a hard time taking care of you. I don't know. And so the baby just kind of two weeks later, I was, I was, we thought it was going to be a boy. Um, but two weeks later, I had a little baby girl. So, and she's what named after you, my other grandma. What did yeah. your daughter think about that? Oh, she was delighted. Oh, wow. She okay. said, she's like, mom, I'm going to help you. I'm going to get up. She's four. Oh, no, no, she, maybe almost five. She's like, I'm going to help you those night feedings. I'm like, okay, Lena, sure, sure. So she's like, wake me up for the first feeding. So once we get home, I wake her up. I got this beautiful picture of her eyes closed, feeding her sister. <laughs> and, and so I go to wake her up for the second time. It was a weekend. I'm like, yeah. I, wake, I go to wake her up second time. She's like, no, mom, that's okay. You got it. You got it. Uh, <laughs> oh, priceless. Okay. <laughs> but this was your way of healing. And maybe this was your way of taking on a, a responsibility for someone else proving that that indeed the what happened to you will not happen to this child but you have actually you make you will make a difference was that a conscious fault or was the subconscious or did it not play a role at all mm. Well, it's hard to articulate that, I think. Um, one of the things I did was I read this book called The Primal Wound, and it was about the trauma for the birth mother, the baby, and the adoptive mother. It's written by a psychologist who had also adopted, but she interviewed her adult daughter about mm. the adoption process. And I learned things like birthdays for adopted kids aren't always happy with gifts it's a reminder that they have a birth mother that that mm. couldn't keep them for whatever reason mm. um and so that book really helped me um when I brought Grace home she was very um she cried a lot and I and I had read the book so I was like okay she knows she, I I knew immediately she knew it's not her birth mother um even though I was there at, at birth with her she just knew mm. I was not her and so I looked and she, and this wasn't in the book. I just, it was God intuition. Mm. I, I got, I look, I got right into her little infant eyes. And I said, I know I'm not her, but I'm really going to do a good job loving you. And she stopped crying. Hasn't really cried since really. She's, <laughs> she's moody, but she's, she's cool too. Beautiful. Yeah. Doesn't really cry much. <laughs> so here you were an occupational therapist, uh, not occupational, uh, sure. a, um, I'm lacking mental the word. Health. Mental health therapist? That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's a beautiful word of, of putting mm. it. Um, I'm not sure how, how that translate into the different cultures. I don't know what the Japanese system is like, um, but, but you were providing help. How, obviously, your Japanese must have been bloody good by then. No, I worked on a, a government base. I worked with Marines. Oh, I see. So, I, so I see. spoke. I spoke more four-letter words. <laughs> okay, now I'm with you. So, Okinawa <laughs> was that was that the, the the placement where you were, or was there were the other bases in in? Uh, oh, in, there's lots of bases in oh. Okinawa, Japan. Yeah. Did, Air okay. Force, Air Army, they all have bases in Okinawa. Oh, right. Goodness. Yeah. So I, I mean, I like. My daughter went to an all Japanese school. It was immersed in the language. I took a class or two, but, but I can't speak Japanese in my life. <laughs> Say konnichiwa. Yeah, well, that's what. That's, that's what. So, well, at least it. you 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 can you can show respect, uh, and that is mm -hmm. beautiful. Oh, okay, wow. How did the story continue? I mean, you're you okay. were then still focused on others. You were helping your young daughters. You were you were a mama bear. You were trying to find yourself trying to cope with two divorces trying to to figure out life mm -hmm. what was the transformation next what was the journey how did you how did you become the woman that you are now i i think the answer is i just always loved learning and exploring and traveling so 
I had the girls really involved in things. I remember one soccer season when I was a single mom of two kids, I said to my daughter, Lena, I said, Lena, I don't think I can do this season anymore. And she said, that's okay, mom. So I took a season of soccer off. <laughs> I was just so tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. but it also means that you actually had to insight instead of pushing yourself and being angry and then angry with your child, that would have been what I would have done and then crashed and burned and being upset that I'm a failure and, and putting myself down. You actually had the insight of saying, whoa, enough is enough. I need, I need, I need a break here, mm -hmm. which is wow. Yeah, I, she, I do that quite often because with the pattern of working a lot, yeah. I, I plan breaks now. Good. Uh, Good. To just, I, well, I know I can't maintain as I age. I, I can't maintain the <laughs> the crazy work life uh, for extended periods of time. That's true. So it's either crash and burn or plan something fun. So exactly. In October, I'm going to Poland <laughs> for a few few days, and then after that, I'm going to Austin, Texas, for a conference. Did you say so. Poland, as in? Yes the country just east of Germany yes, and just west of Russia, mm -hmm. which is currently a little playing funny games. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you have done a wise choice here? I mean, I like your, your yeah. adventure tourism here. I mean, have you thought about camping on the Golan Heights um, or maybe? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bears <laughs> okay you have no fear <laughs> i really don't it's really bizarre what makes me scared driving at night <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay that's a fairly new development the anxiety doesn't like me driving at well because i think as i get older too that the, the eye thing it's oh. i don't know i i was very I love driving as a teenager and young adult. I don't like driving as much. So, but yeah, I it's, mean, I, we're all changing. I, I, Come on, we're yeah. all changing. So let's admit to that. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, now I'll go anywhere. Beautiful. But then again, <laughs> you take action. You actually take action. You are no longer anywhere close to the victim. You're not even yeah. the survivor. You are the thriver. And that's mm -hmm. what is in your po in your podcast in heal thrive dream um it's the thrive and it's the dream mm -hmm. and that actually allows you to heal so th they are interwoven these concepts and we often yes. we often don't realize that when we're in the darkness we often don't we we forget the power of taking action and here you were taking action all along um starting by running away uh, starting by locking the door, all these kind of things. You took action. You were, you were a victim, but at the same token, you clawed back the control, and that is that is powerful. And now you have strategized or uh, put the whole thing a bit more in a better framework, rather than instinctively and gut reaction kind of response. But you're actually nowadays you're helping others to overcome their traumas and that's beautiful what really threw you into that I mean you always were yeah. helping others but right what was what the change really, what really max well maximize that the word I know the word but I can't say it it's ex exponentially yeah maybe that's was I went to yeah I went to a uh conference called dream builders oh uh, yeah yeah um uh, mary morrissey mary morrissey yeah that's right and that that was life-changing for me yeah i i thought i already had my dream and uh -huh. so i hadn't been dreaming um because i had the nice house at this point i had the awesome husband i had the three children because when i remarried i had a son uh -huh. at 40 which He's amazing. So I have three beautiful children. You know, I I had the the federal job. You know, I built I, 
I made my way up to uh, department chief at one point. Um, so I thought I had the dream. Yeah. And so, but I, when I saw the ad for Mary Morrissey, I was very captivated by that. And I'm like, ooh, uh-huh. maybe I should be dreaming more. And that's uh-huh. when I went to the conference and I started to dream about, you know, um, what more would look like for me. And, and it's okay to, to want and strive for more. I was like, well, I'm already a damn good therapist. But then it came to me, the one-to-one work, you're, yeah. you can only help so many people. Uh-huh. So then I knew I wanted to have, um, do more uh, larger scale, like virtual group memberships where I could help uh, more than one person at a time. So now I have a virtual membership online yeah. where um, a woman from all over the world, you know, can be members and, and have accountability and fellowship with each other, help each other. So yeah, that's what the the dream was, and I'm I'm still building that now. And it's so, so. beautiful, isn't it, to mm-hmm. to take such opportunities or such such ideas, let them percolate around a bit, and you think, oh, can I really do that? Who am I to do that? I mean, do you get imposter syndrome? Did you? Oh. Did... <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even the po- I still can't believe I'm doing a podcast. Oh, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know. And at first, I talked myself into it because I thought I was just going to do voice, and then I, and then everybody was like, "Well, you should do video and have it on YouTube, YouTube yeah. as well." And I was like, "Damn it!" You know, <laughs> you know. So that means I really have to have my shit together a little bit, like slap on some lipstick sometimes or something. Uh, you know. So. <laughs> I'm still working on getting my shit together. It's, it's been a process. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't be at that point until, or even on my deathbed, I won't have my shit together. Right. Okay. Right. So that's it. When other people have their ducks in a row, I've got some squirrels and they're in a rave and they just had coffee and sugar. Okay. And they're bouncing around. This is my animals. Okay. So, and, but that is, that is my life. My life is chaos, but I'm increasingly in the driver's seat so this is my circus uh, and i'm now the ringmaster i'm no longer the bearded lady um and <laughs> i think that is that is the beautiful thing my monkeys are still going nuts that's okay <laughs> but that's my circus and i'm dealing with it so and i think that is the beautiful thing i've taken i've take i've i've made the conscious choice of living my life more intentionally And you have done the same thing. We are both on the same path here of actually creating a community that makes sense, where we can share thoughts, encourage each other, infuse each other, and allow each other to heal. I think heal is the best word, to mm-hmm. which it which also translate into growth, post traumatic growth. That's really the I think where it all boils down to we are practicing our resilience by Mm -hmm. telling our our story by listening to other stories gaining more insights get there for maybe getting asked funny questions during interview and you think yeah i've not thought about that and it is a beautiful beautiful journey and so therefore it is i'm so pleased for you that that you did all that and that you you're going out there you're constantly exposing yourself to new experiences and your yeah. growth in the last six months alone um would have been tremendous um you were talking about the imposter syndrome with the oh yeah kind of look <laughs> on your face um and it's 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 beautiful so here you're growing but you're allowing others to see that You're transparent, yeah. you're authentic in your life. And that makes you such a beautiful role model. You're honest about the trauma that you have gone through. And mm-hmm. you're now sharing the lessons that you learned the hard way. And that's powerful. That's beautiful. Thank that's you. humbling. And for that, I'm I'm so grateful that that you came onto my show and actually shared all those those insights. Wow. Uh Karen. If people wanted to to gel with you, and and or if they have gelled with you and now want to know more about you, where can they find you? The best link I have for people to find me 
has one stop. All my websites, my publications, my um, websites, I think, did I say that twice? My store, all that <laughs> is a Karen Robinson. 360.com. Karen Robinson, 360.com. Guys, look down there into the description of the YouTube video and of the podcast because you've got the link down there. Once you're down there, press the like and subscribe button. And don't miss any of these other beautiful interviews that I've got here. I've got, I'm so privileged to to have such wonderful guests like you, Karen. Um I I learned so much from my guests. I mean, for me, it's it's you are interview 304. Now, each of these interviews is between Uh-oh. 60 and 90 minutes. That means I had 304 60 to 90 minute um, sessions, really, in which I grew. And mm-hmm. some of them you. were hard work. Some of them were so fun. And some of them, they were just out of this world. Why? Uh, because I, I chose to show up. I chose to just live my life intentionally. And that is what I recommend you all guys out there to do. Yes, you have suffered trauma. Yes, you have gone through shit times. And you probably are in shit times because otherwise you wouldn't listen to to that that video here or that podcast. And it's it's good that because it, it puts you into a position where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, where you are so outside of your comfort zone that you simply have to take action it does no longer it does no longer work to stay passive and that's powerful so now you just have to decide what is the next step because you're ready to take action you're ready to make a choice and you know you could do far worse than actually check karen out um if if her story has dealt with you and see if her community uh will not allow you to grow and become a different person and grow in response and maybe then you become the light in the darkness of someone else and if we all do that hell could we not make this world a bit of a better place yeah so karen i'm i'm so grateful that you were on my show thank you so much Thank you so much for having me today. I enjoyed talking with you. (laughs) Look after yourself and review your Poland, your Poland trip that puts cold sweat on my... (laughs) 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 I mean, there's some, there's, please, Poland is a beautiful, beautiful country. And there's some beautiful places there and and some nice food in all fairness. Okay. Krakow and, 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 and and beautiful sausages and things like that. So please, there are so many good reasons why you want to go to Poland. Um, mm-hmm. just look after yourself and I think that is the best message to all of you out there mm-hmm. guys live with passion and look after yourself bye <laughs> dream on, dream on, dream on, dream it till you